Welcome to Hashtag Sexy Authors Podcast, a podcast about very important books and the people who write them, centering more specifically underrepresented communities such as sexual minorities, giving them a space to amplify their voices, their messages, bringing very important information to the forefront. In a time of banned books and worldwide chaos, Hashtag Sexy Authors hopes to offer intellectual refuge, respite, and connect you with these very important books. Hosted by sex therapist and author Moshumi Ghosh, licensed marriage and family therapist. Hello, and welcome to the Sexy Authors Podcast, a podcast about very important books and the very important people who write them. I'm your host, Mo. Today, I have with me Dr. Gloria Brame. She is a legendary author, award-winning sex therapist, and certified sexologist. And Dr. Gloria G. Brame has been a pioneer of BDSM fetish study, education, research, and advocacy for over 30 years. She is an emeritus member of ASECT, which is the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Dr. Gloria Rame also founded the first online peer support forum for kinky people on CompuServe in 1987 and published her first bestseller, Different Loving, in 1993. Her books have won many awards and accolades for their penetrating insights into adult sexuality. Gloria has maintained a passionate commitment to helping sexually non-conventional people overcome obstacles and find their joy. Gloria has also authored 11 books in different genres to spread her gospel that sex and gender diversity is the true norm for adults. Everybody, welcome Gloria. Hi, Gloria. It's so wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited about this conversation that we're going to have today and then to also talk about your latest book, but I just want to get, I want our audience to sort of like, to get to know you. You're like the pioneer you're in my world. You're a the pioneer. So I feel especially honored to be sitting here and chatting with you today. I've looked up to you and admired your work for as long as I can remember. So, um, feeling very on the covered wagons. That's true. (laughs) That's how old I am. (laughs) The covered wagons. I love it. Well, I I mean, you are a true pioneer. Like you've been doing this long before. I just did, I just did a video about same sex marriage, for example. And even something as same sex marriage is so recent and, you know, wasn't legal until 2015. And so the work that you've been doing has been so needed And, you know, like, I guess one of my first questions for you is like, what inspired you to go against the grain, you know, in such a major way? And ruin my career as it was. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us. I was an English professor at the time and a freelance uh, writer, Mm -hmm. um, writing business articles because I had a finance background in my 20s, even though I was an English major. I ended up, it's a long tortured story. But anyway, so um, I started on the sly, in other words, under a handle. I started a BDSM support group about two years after I got involved with BDSM because the big revelation to me about kink uh, I'd always had kinky fantasies, even even when I was a kid, you know. Most and, people do. Yes. And I knew I had what people might call fetishes, and I was very ashamed about it. And I would propose something to a guy, and almost every guy turned me down and made me feel like a freak. But I did find one or two partners who were, you know, moderately into it. And I finally came to find my truth and dealt with it. But it was a very revolutionary period in my life. 
because it really changed everything, but it also gave me enormous relief to realize there was a label I could use for myself. Mm. And if I use that label, I could meet other people who had the same label and they wouldn't think I was freakish. They would appreciate me. I mean, I learned that myself by getting online. So I started this um, support group on yeah. CompuServe. I don't even know if it still exists, but it, it was the game back in the 80s. And um, what was amazing to me is I thought, you know, there were like 100 or 200 of us in the whole United States, <laughs> maybe. Mm -hmm. Because my exposure was really limited. It was there was like a club you went to in New York. Um, and then I discovered online, and this was before most people were even online. It right. was a very small pool, maybe a few hundred thousand people, not even a million yet at that point. And we had an incredible membership spike. Wow. Uh, course of running that group we started with like 40 people we uh -huh. ended up with seventy five thousand people in two years wow so that told me that there was really a lot of interest in this and really must be a lot of people in the closet and in fact a lot of the people who joined the group said oh my god this is the first time i've ever had any dialogue about this this is the first time of course, everyone used handles. This is the first time I've talked about it to anybody. And that's what inspired me to write the book, was the idea that, well, if that many people show up on, there wasn't even an internet. They showed, not a real internet. They showed up on CompuServe back in the mid 80s. If there were enough people to cram the server you know then what must the interest be throughout the country and I was talking to a friend of mine I'm a po I was a poet I haven't published in a while but a fellow poet at the time and he's like you know you 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 make this whole I think he called it SMBG or something you know he didn't know what to call it you know but you make it sound like like regular humans do it <laughs> I remember thinking, there it is yeah regular humans do do it that's who yeah. does it you know it's not just this this freakish minority which had been my misapprehension mm -hmm. until I finally came to terms with it myself and started going to clubs uh and there were a couple of more clubs to go to by the late 80s Yes. You know, I realized, my God, there are a lot of people who are doing this, you know, or interested and intrigued by some aspect of it. And he said, you really ought to write a book about that, you know, because you'll explain it in a way that, that you know, isn't scary. And you normalize it for people, right? You normalize, normalize it for people it. to make it more acceptable and right. approachable. And one of the... um offshoots of my research, which was voluminous since I was already a college professor, I knew how to do research. Right. And my research showed me two radically to me important things. Important thing, number one, all those people who originally came up with, you know, with the labeling of sexual disorders and sexual dysfunctions and sexual fetishes. So going all the way back to Kraft Ebbing and even Havelock Ellis, mm -hmm. you know, they always presumed it was a flaw that all human sexuality should be heteronormative, binary, mm -hmm. you know, Vanilla. and it's all about intercourse and mm -hmm. anything else you know, as I discovered, was viewed as a potential psychopathy. Yeah. And that psychiatrists viewed it that way because you would go to the DSM of the day mm -hmm. and anything that was uh, other than intercourse, other than reproductive sex, yeah, 
considered sinful, and that include blowjobs and hand jobs and masturbation. Botany, yeah, all of that is pathology. All of that, right. And they were sending people to asylums and put them on psychiatric drugs and really basically, you know, torturing people for homosexuality too. Yeah. So first of all, I realized that they're very... Victorian assumptions about what sex should be were th completely theoretical. It didn't have a lick of science, certainly not as we define science in the modern age, mm -hmm. a lick of science to support it. They had no studies, they had no surveys, they had no scholars gathering research on these issues. And basically, what we could keep some of the labels, but this notion that it uh, implied that people were um, mentally unhealthy, mentally unwell, was dead wrong. Mm -hmm. So that was a great surprise. And being the person I am, being a poet, I always felt the important thing was connecting to people with truth, you know? Yes. And that the truth really, really matters. So you right. can imagine what my political positions are. But anyway, <laughs> truth really yeah. counts, you know. And the second revelation, of course, was, or the logical conclusion was, they were so wrong about that. They were so wrong about so-called normal. Yeah. That they were probably wrong about everything. And that sexual diversity, as I then pursued my uh, scholarship into that area uh -huh. of what is normal sex. And my conclusion was that sexual diversity is the norm, mm -hmm. which means, yes, there are people who are monogamous and binary and heteronormative, and that's what's normal for them. But there are also people who are homosexual, bisexual, asexual, all of these other things, and non-binary and trans, you know, and that all of it was normal because it had always existed. Yeah. No matter how many attempts there had been by governments and churches, synagogues, yeah. temples, and um mosques to bury that kind of knowledge and instead promote this you know religio political platform that we must all do exactly this because we know what god wants you know my feeling was why would we be so diverse then why would we be born diverse why would people like me basically look back at you know, who I was even when I was five and was yeah. fascinated by bondage in those old pirate movies. <laughs> yeah, that was like why I was there. Yeah, you know? yeah. Seeing bondage and other, you know, power relationships like that. Yeah. So that that changed everything for me. And actually, I think it has been a catalyst for... A lot of people who don't even know I exist and don't know my name, but it's been a, a catalyst to get more and more people to question what is normal, really? Yeah. Other than just take it on faith. For sure. Your work has been so important in, in the field. Um, and maybe people don't know your name and your, your you know, contributions, but they have been great because... I mean, look at where we are now. I mean, even right. like with the cheesy sort of like mainstream movies that come out that don't really represent BDSM and kink in the, mm -hmm. the way that they could, they're still out there, right? They're still yeah. getting more and more um, I don't, media. Presence. I don't feel that any of the movies do because the more BDSM affirmative movies tend to focus on the community and mm -hmm. The BDSM community, I am a part of it. I love it. Most of my friends are kinky. Um, 
that only represents yet another small side. Yeah. It's really global phenomenon. Yeah. That people are by nature attracted to power relationships. People in every country in the world have been recorded to have fetishes. And what blows my mind is that it doesn't matter where you grow up. Chances are you're going to have the same fetishes in Eastern cultures as you do in Western cultures. The same fetishes in African cultures as you have in Swedish cultures. Yeah. yeah. And how does that happen? Well, right. And and submission and dominance, like I I I believe that, and I tell this to my clients often, like that's where when we tap into our fantasies and we we notice like are you being submissive in your fantasies are you being domineering in your fantasies like that's all part of the spectrum and it's such a window to our soul and what what we desire um and it also can create balance in our lives like these are the types of things that i try to encourage my clients to look at and when we do that we start introducing this concept to them like oh i do kind of enjoy being submissive in my fantasies or submissive with my partner um but people separate that from this idea like everybody thinks bdsm is whips and chains and physical pain right. and um and that there must be something wrong with the person that's um exactly. engaging in it right that's still extremely prevalent because as much as I think that we like to um, say that we're a progressive country, we're actually still a pretty Christian-based, religious-based, faith-based um, society, you know? Yes. I mean, even when the social mores, as they are in the United States, kind of loose and weird... You know, there's tremendous religious opposition to anything that is non-traditional sex. Always. How yeah. do religions really grow? They grow by you having children and indoctrinating them into that religion from birth on. Yeah. And then try to force them to stick with it. But as we see, there have always been people who cannot. You know, yeah. and it's not because they're, you know, they're sinners. It's, it's not. because I believe, and I'm hoping that epigenetics and the continued unraveling of genomes are going to prove that there is a genetic basis for the commonalities we see globally. Yeah. You know. It's, it's human nature. It is human you know, nature. The more and more research that's being done, it, it, it you know, is showing that this is all human nature and the things that they're telling us that are normal in quotes um, that are actually normative are not based in science, right? They're not based in any actual research. They're based on um, this idea of heaven and hell. They're based on, you know, this idea of sin and none of that is, um, is based in science. And it's all about shaming you into obedience. Yes. That it's about control. True. At the end of the day, we all know those of us that do this work, that is a lot about control and supporting the patriarchy. And um, we won't even get into that on this, on this conversation. Cause I want to talk about you, Dr. Gloria, uh, okay. you've done such important work and uh, you have a new book out. Um, and so, so t I want you to first tell us about different loving a little bit, tell our audience about that. And then the journey of the different, cause you write in a different, in a bunch of different genres, the journey from then to the journey to the book that you just came out with now. Well, as I said, I was a poet and literary writer. Uh, I thought that's what I was going to do professionally. <laughs> Um, writing different loving changed all that because I couldn't really work at my colleges anymore. I couldn't teach anymore. You know, I, I got fired it. from jobs. Well, because in 1993, that book made me a notorious, untrustworthy, perverted psycho. 
in some circles. <laughs> in other circles, <laughs> you were very much celebrated. The circles that had power over yeah. institutions and yes. over I got censored from everything, like the first five years after. Only one place didn't censor me, and that was Cosmopolitan Magazine. And I thanked them for helping me get through some, you know, really tough financial years after the book came out. But I, you know, nobody at the time, you know, I laugh now because now, like, people rush to review outrageous books, but not in the 90s. I just got censored everywhere. I even got censored from a book signing that I was supposed to have at, at the former borders because they were like, no, we don't, corporate is afraid it'll look like we're endorsing your perversions. You know, so I came out of that experience, but here's the thing, I kind of knew it was gonna happen, you know, and I accepted that risk. And I was married to a fellow kinky person and my co-author on the book, William Bream. And, you know, we kind of decided, we made a pact that if the other one was okay with it, then it, it was good for the team, you know? Yeah. So I just kept moving ahead and I went back to school and got a PhD. So I initially got it so that it would, for my the next book I plan to write, maybe I thought with a PhD that would remove some stigma. Uh-huh. That makes you know, sense. When I wrote Different Loving, I didn't have a PhD. Okay. Um, but as a writer, first of all, that was the first nonfiction book I'd ever written. Mm -hmm. I had tried my hand at novels, never finished them, never published them. But I had never had such an extensive nonfiction writing thing going on in my life. And after I was done with it, I mean, it was really interesting. And I was really happy that I had succeeded in writing this big nonfiction book. But it didn't feed my soul the way the creative writing does. Uh-huh. So what I decided to do was to experiment with whatever book genres I could. And that meant uh, I did write my next two books were nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And after that, I started working on some memoirs. And after that, in the last five years, um, I've written so far three books in novel form. This last book, actually, that I just published called Kink So Real is actually a group of interwoven stories with a, a cast of characters that most, some of whom appeared in the earlier two novels. And my goal with all of that, first of all, was to feed my soul, you know, because one novel I wrote when Trump was elected and I was having a psychic breakdown and the other novel yes uh i wrote when covid began okay because again the idea of just tying myself down to something that would be very uh nonfiction is just a slog you know it's just copious copious research and there is very little room to be creative yeah and i needed something that nourished me so I thought that's it I'm gonna write my first novel and publish it and I did and um but my goal through all of these books every one of my books is actually to kind of tell the same story about sex in different genres so for example my memoir is about really about how a person like me a sexual revolutionary you know, what made me revolutionary? And a lot of it had to do with the experiences I'd had and how much diversity I had witnessed. Mm -hmm. Even in my early, you know, from the time I was 12 or 13 until, and also my parents were kind of lefty. So they never gave me any kind of religious guilt complex or religious shame. I mean, Mm -hmm. Still, social 
guilt and social shame about you know who you are with other people um but not that inner torment that people with religious trauma who i often treat you mm -hmm. know deal with when they grow up so to me even when i was a kid i was like these two people are married but they seem to me like they hate each other I, you know, do they even have a sex life? They probably don't, or, you know, right. and like, what, what's going on with them? Yeah. You know, because back in those days, even divorce was considered shameful yeah. and a betrayal of your faith. Right. You marry somebody, it's permanent. You have no, you have no agency once you sign that contract. And once I started fooling around and sleeping around with guys in my teens. I was an early bloomer, needless to say. Um, no two were alike. Yeah. Some of them wanted this and some of them wanted that. And some of them, I didn't know what it was called. But when I looked back, I realized they were pretty kinky. Yeah. Did they even know they were kinky? Or it's Sometimes it's, yeah, it's, sometimes it's the definitions, it's the labels that trips people up, right? Yeah. Absolutely, because like I remember, and I was very young, this was an early boyfriend with whom I had, I guess what you would call soft swinging, you know, and that it was, <laughs> uh, there was, there was no fluid exchange really between us, but we were fooling around naked. And I remember, you know, he wanted me to knee him in the groin and he kept saying harder. And I always thought like, if you need a man in the groin, you know, he would break, yeah. you know, scream, but he loved it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, it took me 20 years to realize, whoa, that's kinky. <laughs> <laughs> that is hella kinky. You that's know? hella kinky. Yeah. Yeah. That's hella kinky. You know, where I think back on, you know, the guy who thought it would be really cool if I called him master in bed or, you know what I mean? And this wasn't because I was looking for kink or I was seeking out kinky partners at all. I was just looking for guys to make out with, you know, yeah. and make a little extra, you know, maybe a, a handy <laughs> throw in or something like that. Yeah. But their needs and desires, you know, they were completely different universes as I got experience. And I thought that was, so when I write my memoirs, that's, I talk a lot about that. You know, I talk a lot about my shock at how people could even be homophobic. My family was not homophobic. Right. They were not comfortable with it, yeah. but that's far away from being homophobic. It's like, it's not like if they met a homosexual, they'd be like, angry right hostile or anything they just sort of giggle and say oh you know yeah I mean, okay. a lot of that has to do with the visibility and not being exposed to it as much right it makes you giggle right yeah, exactly yeah. but then there's then they there's a little uncomfortable. They, right they weren't grateful and they really weren't even prejudiced they were very well aware mm -hmm. that there were people like that right. you know uh, that maybe some of their friends might be. And they just never talked about it because they always felt that sex was in the private realm, which I believe as well. You know, that you don't owe anybody any explanation of what you like to do in, when you're being sexual with somebody. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that. Like, it is a private thing, you know, as as, you know, activists and revolutionaries and educators you know, we've had to make it more public for our political platform. But mm. at the end of the day, and, and so that people don't suffer from that shame, right? They can do what they need to do um, behind closed doors with their partners, with consent. Um, but the platform I think that you and I have, we have to, you know, it does have to be a little bit more public to make right. that, to, to have more massive change, and when I, you know, in the old days, it's completely changed now. But in, let's say, in the 90s, everybody wanted to know, you know, would you, you know, they would want me to, like, whip somebody on TV. And I'd be, no, that's like asking 
Dr. Ruth, may she rest in peace, to give a blowjob on TV to demonstrate it. No, it's my sex life. Yeah. Yeah. So, you could run a, teach a class on it, mm -hmm. charge so, them, but not for, not for television. Right. And yeah. so with my memoirs, I talked about my personal history, what I think, not what made me pervy, but what it was like just growing up as me, what I went through, all of the experiences, you know, <clears throat> from my traumatic loss of virginity, which I chose, but which turned out not to be anything like what I expected, mm -hmm. to, you know, embracing sexual diversity by yeah. the time I was in my late teens, because by then I had friends, whether they were out or not, who were queer. Yeah. Right. And I think memoir is great for, you know, people can sort of relate to a story right? You know, as opposed to, you know, a book like Different Loving where you're. I love your memoir. <laughs> Thanks, Gloria. Your, your memoir is going to be hot, hot, hot. Coming hot. soon. Yeah. Um, but like Different Loving is for one kind of audience and for one, it serves one kind of purpose, but writing your memoirs definitely serves a different kind of purpose. because, And it also lends to the credibility of you as a person writing books you know, or, or oh, doing right. the research, right? You know, it right. Well, you know. first came the, you know, there's the evidence-based work, which is what my blog is like too. Mm -hmm. I don't really talk about personal stuff. I talk about what goes on in sex therapy usually, or the problems that arise in sex therapy. And it's very evidence-backed. You know, mm -hmm. it's either anecdotal evidence from the office or, I refer to a lot of studies or like I recently wrote an article about all the different ways women can come that mm -hmm. most women are, are not even aware of. In fact, don't even know about. It. yeah, you know, all the different kinds of physical stim that's mm -hmm. going to turn a woman on, you know, with parts of the body that people never expect. Yeah. Would turn women on, including I got email from like, Two women, both post 70, who are like, oh, my God, I learned stuff I never knew. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and and yeah, and yeah, yeah, because sexuality is also a lifelong journey and your body's always changing. So it doesn't matter how old you are. Exactly. Uh, you and you're learn. always evolving. Things that you might have yeah. liked 20 years ago could be stale now new things you know and they should be stale now because we want to continue growing evolving exactly. learning changing yeah so the novel thing i really did it for myself but you know to feed my own spirit because yeah. of all the because you're an artist too at the end of the day <laughs> so so you know but i made these like it was sort of like how do I educate people about BDSM without being a nerd? Yeah. I would say that's kind of what, that was part of writing these novels, which awesome. is writing stories about people I felt that I really, really knew because almost every character in the book, I always had a particular friend or sometimes two friends and I kind of borrowed from both their lives, you know, so I have like in this latest one, Kink So Real, you know, uh, I have the lovelorn submissive guy who gets ripped off early in his journey and finally finds an extremely unconventional woman to accept him as he is. Okay, uh-huh. Um, I write about the I, main, I feel like I have clients that I can share that book with. Cause that's going to be, that's a, that's a thing. Where do they find their partners and that right. it's possible to find someone and how you overcome, uh -huh. um, all the sort of ableist crap because the dominatrix he falls in love with is a very tiny woman. Hmm. She cooks, she considers herself a dwarf. He does not. He finds her petite. But she, you know, by the huh? textbooks, she says, I fit the label. 
And he's like, it, the, you know, the label is bullshit. You are who you are. You're a wonderful human being just in a smaller package. Or I have uh, a triad in, who are in their 70s and 80s and have stuck together for like 30 or 40 years through thick and thin. And now they're retiring and just, I mean, they're completely retired and they're just planning to live out their years together and out of the blue they somehow end up adopting in the kinky way, you know, taking in some people who are much younger than them. And at first they're like really horrified. Why would anyone in their thirties or forties want to play with people in their seventies and eighties? But actually it turns out to be a, a wonderful blessing to everybody. And they have a, they lead a lifestyle relationship, the triad with one of them, who was a former pro dom being their head of the house. And they're okay. like super happy people, you know? I love that your book, this this new book, Kink So Real tackles ableism, ageism, all around kink and sexuality and BDSM. That's all really great. It's, really it's great. all of these topics. Some of the members, so the main character in all, or a main character in all three of the books in this series, um, she was a pro dumb, and, and you could read about her journey mm -hmm. in um, a 20 year look at her life in Amazon Hammer, which is really focused on her and her book life. Right before that, you wrote right before right. this one, right? Okay, right, the prequel to this one. In this one, she emerges another 12 years later when she's married the love of her life a submissive mm -hmm. guy she mm -hmm. randomly met. Uh, she was raised by her great gay grandfather. So okay. she had a completely different perspective on everything. And they have children and she moved away from being a pro dom and moved away from the scene and formed her own little leather family. Okay. Wow. Really colorful characters with right. uh, like really in-depth backgrounds and really yeah, kind I, of exposing right. the, the diversity of you know, exactly. So nature. it's right. And there are gay people in the family, and there are black people in the family, and people are all kinds of different ages in the family. There's a lesbian couple, there's a couple of gay bon vivants in the family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are people uh, of all different ages, although. They're, even her children appear in the book, you know, but they're not part of the larger BDSM things. And she sets her husband up to work as a pro dom, as a professional master, even though he was submissive to her. Uh -huh. And he's finding it to be an exhilarating journey. And then you get to peek in on some of the mm, more intense fetishes. Uh -huh. You know, because I picked two fetishes that a lot of people have problems with. Oh, okay. We'll have to read the book to find out what those are. It's exciting. I mean, you're such a prolific sexual revolutionary, like so many different types of so many genres. How many books is it? 12 books? Did you say? I think I have 11, but I might have 12. I don't know. I've written some short books. I don't count them. <laughs> And what's next? I mean, are you going to write? I'm sure you're going to continue writing. I have at least two more books I have to write or life has no meaning. But <laughs> when I'm done with those two, I'll have two more books I have to write or life has no meaning. Um, yeah. My next book, actually, I did a series of nonfiction books called The Truth About Sex. Uh -huh. So volume one was called Sex and the Self, and it's really all about your relationship with your own sexuality. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a big focus on masturbation and what it means and how normal it is and how we are wired. It's not a sin. It's something we are wired to do for very good biological reasons and also for relationship reasons um, so that it's an important, I call it a masturbation in your youth, a stepping stone to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And um, the second book was about 
all of the diversity and variety that people find in partnerships. Mm -hmm. So that one was a bit, had a section that was very sort of multicultural where I talk about, look, you know, if you go to Nepal, it's common for a woman to have a couple of husbands. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you go to other places, I won't get into all of it, but you know, just the variety of choices that are normal in other cultures that we have to look outside of American culture to get a picture of what human sexuality is. Absolutely. A lot of people have just uh, swallowed the politically correct line according to religion and political party. Yeah. And that does not tell us anything about mm -hmm natural human behavior yeah. so your next book is going to be a, a is the it the third, third? Oh, yeah. the third right. in the series yeah Great. i know the last one was published like in 2012 and i said coming next year that was <laughs> that was hopeful you i'm guilty what? of that too I, it's it's in the works and then like 10 years later 15 years yeah. later yeah. so i'm i am gonna do that uh both because my publisher expects it and because I expect it of myself, <laughs> you know, so I am going to write. Um, and now our listeners expect it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the real thing is, you know, some people are like, write another book on BDSM, but I want to make it bigger again. You know, I don't want it. And my, these books in the truth about sex series, of course, I normalize transgenderism. I normalize BDSM. Everything is normal if enough people do it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a population of people doing this particular thing and you can even see that it's a global population, hey, that's it's, normal. It's going to, ch it changes people's perspective 100%. Yeah. And people, the thing is, is that people need to hear it. People need to see it because it's also a reflection of them. Most right. people identify with it. And don't even, re some don't even realize they do. And of course, the people that show up in our offices, they're already struggling with it. But then there's all the people that don't show up in our offices that maybe have pushed it down, ignored it, repressed it, all of the things. So yeah. um, it's- And at the time when I wrote the, the, those first two volumes, it was really hard to find research. So what I had to do was go and read all these medical studies <laughs> and not or, a or conduct your own research <laughs> I had it. and what I did is I put together like this really crazy um interdisciplinary patchwork of studies showing how good masturbation was you by well hey you know a bunch of psychologists did the study and people feel a lot less depressed when they masturbate and I you know, did this urological study and wow, people have better penis health if they masturbate three times a week and wow, you know, and uh, cardiologists are reporting that, you know, the common trait among people who don't have heart problems seems to be that they masturbate a certain number of times a week. So easy to conclude from that, that orgasm is a vital function in human life yeah. for human health. So now oh my god you know i mean so many places have quoted me about that stuff now it's like common knowledge it and is but i think that like the voice the common knowledge is spreading but mm -hmm. people are still hearing the voices of w whether it's their pastor or their parents you know it's less so among the current generation than yeah. ever before I mean, people who were born and immediately got on the internet as children, they know so much more they than do. their parents or their grandparents about sex, and nothing really freaks them out. And I see people in my practice who are leaving religions precisely because they have access to that information, and they're like, what? Yeah. So many people are, are leaving religion and, and coming to this kind do do this kind of work as well. So. Right. And a lot of them, they're going to find something that works for them, 
but they're not going they're not going back to their parents faith no no yeah they're choosing faiths that will accept and accommodate them uh, and not make them feel like you know they're going to hell because they like to kiss a same sex partner you know they're yeah. so they're going to i think that's going to be a big change that okay. will continue to evolve and they're not going to be upset if their kid comes out as gay either mm -hmm. or kick their trans kid out of the house or mistreat them and send them to conversion therapy and all of those horrible hateful things so what has changed so much and so fast is the internet and its impact on how people receive information about sex and are open now. I mean, the diversity is out of the closet, you know, and it's good and it's bad, you know. Uh, yeah. I'm an optimist. I want to think that it's mainly good, but there is, you know, people are people. There are always going to be bad actors who fuck mm -hmm. them for the others you know but for the most part um i do really admire the young generation for focusing so much energy on what is consensual and learning about consent culture which really comes from kinky people yep. you know kind of innovative and educated on it mm -hmm. you know and, and but that's fine let the mainstream have it as long as they don't hurt anybody you know what i mean that's if they're that's right that's the the best possibility you know is that these kinds of conversations and intentional sex and stuff like that you know these are beautiful values i think so i'm pretty yeah. happy about that and that's probably some of what i'm going to write about you know but i think i'll take a more personal term turn this time and not yeah. have everybody with the science yeah you could do a self-help sciencey memoir <laughs> <laughs> all in one <laughs> all in one that's the thing it's a thing well uh, dr gloria brame this has been such an awesome conversation um you know i've gotten to know you kind of over the years so this really gave you know gives me a lot of insight into how you became such a, you know, a profound <laughs> when figure I, in, our, in our field. When I realized that sex could be a scholarly pursuit, my Game whole life changed. It, yeah. it, it just changed my life. It was, for the first time in my life, I felt like, wow, this is really meaningful. It's meaningful to me personally, and it's meaningful to the world. And I'm pas as passionate about it now at age 69 as I was when I first encountered it at age 30. So I think it's pretty cool. It's very cool. All right. So um, I'm going to put Dr. Gloria Brame's links down in the comments below or down in the caption below, um, along with where you can buy her latest book, Kink So Real and where you can get in touch with her for counseling, sex therapy, um, public speaking, what have you. I'll put all those links down. And thank you so much for chatting with me today, it Dr. Is, it is always a pleasure speaking with you, Ma. All right, thank really you. Is. Okay, all right. thank you Take for care. letting me uh, speak to your audience. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much. Take all care. Right. Bye. You too. Bye.